Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland, including later today meeting pupils from Brunstein Primary School to celebrate World Book Day. Keza Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. For years, the SNP have promised to abolish the hated council tax. It was in both their 2007 and 2011 manifestos. Thousands of leaflets were delivered, billboard after billboard was plastered with the promise to scrap the unfair council tax. The only thing she scrapped yesterday was the council tax freeze. She could have broken her promise on day one, so why did it take 10 years? Well, of course, First Minister, since 2007, uh, we've made sure there have been eight years soon to be nine years of a council tax freeze, saving the average Bandy council tax payer £1,500. And Labour have moaned about that every single step of the way. What we announced yesterday, presiding officer, are plans to make local tax fairer, or as Professor David Bell uh, described it on the radio this morning, certainly progressive. And we also set out how, with new tax powers, we will make the funding of council services in future more closely related to income, something that Labour has also opposed for many, many years. Now, we are doing this in a fair way. Uh, council tax freeze will remain in place uh, for the next year. After that, the council tax will be capped so that we can't go back to the bad old days when Labour increased council tax by 60 percent. The band reforms will mean that people in the highest bands will pay a bit more with exemptions for those in lower incomes, including pensioners. Three out of four households uh, will not pay a single penny more and low income households with children will pay less. And out of all of that, we'll raise an additional £100 million a year for education. These are fair, balanced, reasonable proposals, which is probably why Labour oppose them. We'll get rid once and for all of the unfair council tax. The words of the First Minister. And of course, voters should have known that when the First Minister said she would get rid of the council tax, what she really meant was that she would keep it. The whole process has been a sham. Here's the SNP's formula. Condemn it, freeze it, order a big report, and then go ahead and do it anyway. And it's not just the council tax. The SNP say fracking is bad, and they have imposed a temporary freeze. A big report has been ordered, but all the signs are that they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> Labour would not allow fracking in Scotland. Can the First Minister give that guarantee? First Minister. Before we, First Minister. before we move on uh, from local taxation, presiding officer, which I'm keen still to talk about, uh, let me give, unlike Order. Labour clearly, let me give Labour a Order. bit of, see the First Minister. A bit of hopefully helpful advice. Before Kezia Dugdale decides to adopt her usual position of whinging from the sidelines, and in this case, criticise the SNP's policy on local taxation, it might be a good idea to have a policy on local taxation yourselves. Because Labour, Labour talk about reports. Ian Gray is sitting next to Kezia Dugdale right now. In 2009, Ian Gray, then the Labour leader, set up a commission to decide what Labour's policy on local taxation was going to be. The outcome of that commission has never, ever been published. So we still don't know what Labour's position on local tax is. So before you criticise ours, please have the good grace to come up with one of your own. And on the issue of fracking, uh, Kezia Dugdale's just heard... Order! Just heard uh, the Energy Minister set out the clear position of this government. We will not... We will not allow fracking. They don't like the answer, presiding officer, but perhaps they might want to listen. We will not allow fracking 
in Scotland because we will not take risks with our environment while there are still unanswered questions. That's why we've got a moratorium in place. Presiding officer, her backbenchers don't like her answer in fracking because all their leaflets say they're going to oppose it. All across the country, SNP candidates are telling voters that there will be no fracking under the SNP. The same people who promised to scrap the council tax. The people deserve the truth, First Minister. We know where the Tories stand. They are for it. We know where the Lib Dems stand. They voted for it at their conference. We know where the Greens stand. They are against it. I've said where I stand. Scottish Labour will go into the election with a very clear manifesto commitment. We will oppose fracking. If Jim Ratcliffe of Ineos can get a straight answer, why can't the people of Scotland? Fracking, yes or no, First Minister? First Minister, so anyway, so let me put it simply. First Minister, be let us hear the First Minister. No fracking in Scotland because there is a moratorium on fracking. That what a moratorium means. It ain't allowed to happen because we won't take risks with our environment while there are so many unanswered questions. That's the responsible way of proceeding. Of course, Labour stands up here week after week and says whatever they like about what they would do because, as we already know from Kezia Dugdale, they're going to come second in the election. Kezia Dugdale. <laughs> President officer, Jim Ratcliffe of Ineos says he's had private assurances from her government that the SNP aren't against fracking. His quote says, they are being quite clear. What they've said to us is they are not against fracking. What does he know that we don't? FOIs show that her Environment Agency and the Department of Energy and Climate Change have agreed to stop minuting conversations on fracking. Her government has tendered for research into decommissioning on fracking. If she isn't planning to frack, why is she preparing for the clean-up? So tell me, First Minister, is the SNP promise to stop fracking a real promise, or is it just an election pledge? Look, First I, know, I, I know that Labour are desperate, and I know why Labour are desperate, but this really does take the biscuit. Just for the avoidance of doubt again, presiding officer, there is a moratorium on fracking in Scotland. It is clear and simple, there's a moratorium on fracking, uh, that means no fracking. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, presiding officer, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no immediate plans. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. This morning, the Defence Secretary announced extra funding which will help support our naval base on the Clyde, which is something I welcome. The First Minister and I have an honest disagreement about the decision to renew our nuclear deterrent and for it to remain an integral part of the UK's defence. But it seems to me that all sides of this debate should be able to agree on one thing, that if the subs go, the jobs go. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. No, I uh, support the continuation of Faslane as a naval base. I think it should be a conventional naval base. And I do not believe that we should be spending £167 billion and rising on nuclear weapons that we can't afford, that are not the appropriate defence uh, of our country. That kind of money would be better spent supporting jobs, not just in our defence industries, but across our public services as well. Ruth Davidson. It seems that the First Minister is flying in the face of all the evidence, because the GMB Union, GMB Union has said it's Order. high in the sky to pretend that highly paid, well-skilled defence jobs could be replaced. The Defence Secretary says that thousands of highly skilled jobs would disappear. And even the local MSP, Jackie Bailey, Labour's lone ranger, admits this morning that, and I quote, no one has come up with a credible plan to replace those jobs. The loss of that employment would devastate my local community. Perhaps she has in mind Jeremy Corbyn's new position, which is that we should build the subs, keep the jobs, but just stick the missiles in a shed somewhere. Well, I know that the First Minister linked arms with the Labour leader in London last week, but please tell me she doesn't agree with him on that as well. 
First well, Minister. Actually, I, I didn't link arms because he refused to turn up until after I'd, I'd left for some uh, unknown reason, but I'll leave, I, I'll leave that to him to, to explain. But we know, I have to say to Ruth Davidson, when it comes to the point where you have to call in aid Jackie Bailey, then it really should tell you that your arguments have got rather threadbare. But on the, on the serious issue of defence jobs, I mean, you know, Ruth Davidson should really look at the numbers of defence personnel in Scotland and what has happened to those numbers under this Conservative government. We have seen a hemorrhaging of conventional defence jobs. We have seen the closure of bases. We have seen our forces take a hammering as a result of Tory austerity. And the report that was done uh, a year or so back uh, on uh, the question of whether or not Trident should be renewed set out very clearly the price that conventional forces pay through the obsession with Trident. So my position is clear. Support our conventional forces, support Faz Lane as a naval base, but for goodness sake, let's not spend obscene amounts of money on obscene nuclear weapons when there's so much more we could do with it. Yeah. <laughs> Colin Beattie. Colin Beattie. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to support the 107 workers in Greg's Bakery, Lonehead in my constituency, whose jobs are now under threat as a result of the company's decision to close this facility. First Minister. Well, I was very concerned, as I know uh, the member would have been, to learn of the situation at Greg's Lonehead Bakery. And I know this will be a very anxious time for the bakery's employees and their families. Uh, as soon as the announcement was made, I can advise the member that we immediately contacted the company to offer support for employees through our PACE initiative. Uh, Fergus Ewing will be speaking with Greg's management later today and with union representatives to explore all possible options for supporting the Midlothian site and its workforce. We'll continue to engage and we'll monitor the situation closely and I'll ask uh, the uh, Business Minister Fergus Ewing to update the member after his discussions later today. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Last week, the First Minister cut hundreds of millions of pounds from education budgets. She told us she had no choice. Her hands were tied, but she would bring these cuts to an end as soon as she had the powers. This week, she announced extra money for education. She did so without gaining one single additional power at all. The cruel twist for children is that they will not see a single penny until next year. The First Minister could have invested this money this year. Why didn't she? First Minister. Well, as uh, Willie Rennie will presumably know, because he was here when John Swinney made the announcement in the budget uh, last week, we're actually also doubling the education attainment fund starting in the financial year about to start. And as a result of the announcements made yesterday, from 2017 onwards, we will invest an additional £100 million in education. Uh, that, I think, is welcome investment that I'm sure will be welcomed by people across Scotland, even if not by uh, Willie Rennie. Now, I, I know that the Liberals' position is that having spent the last five years helping the Tories cut our budget, they now want to spend the next five years hiking up the taxes of everyone earning over £11,000 a year. That's not my position. I will continue to argue for a fair and balanced approach which gets money into education. Well, no, the First Minister is wrong. Last week, she told us that she was going to cut education budgets, even though she said, even though she said education was our top priority. Massive cuts for one year could set back a child's chances for a lifetime. Scotland used to have one of the best education systems in the world, but it has now slipped down the international rankings. The situation is urgent. One penny on income tax would generate five times as much for education now than our timid and tardy proposals would next year. So even though she had all the powers she still cut education budgets last week. Surely the First Minister can no longer boast education is our top priority. First Minister. Willie Rennie is now just making things up as he goes along. Gross, 
Gross revenue expenditure on education has increased in each of the last three years. Uh, council plans that show that in this financial year they're spending uh, a further £150 million. Last week uh, the Finance Secretary announced the doubling of the attainment fund. Yesterday I announced plans that will result in an extra £100 million every year for education. Uh, a penny increase on the basic rate of income tax, let me just remind Willie Rennie, would hit every single person in our country earning over £11,000 a year. I do not think that is the right approach. And in terms of world rankings of education, you know, the desire to see Scottish education being the best in the world is why we have embarked on the work around the National Improvement Framework. Willie Rennie has opposed us on that every single step of the way. So instead of moaning from the sidelines, as he's becoming almost as good at as Kezia Dugdale, then maybe he should get behind some of these sensible policies to improve our education system. Question four, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government has done to encourage people to access modern apprenticeship. First Minister. Well, as Richard Lyle states, the most uh, recent uh, apologies, we are taking action, Presiding Officer, uh, to ensure that we are Order. that we are supporting uh, modern apprenticeships. We have a target that we've met every year of 25,000 modern apprenticeships. Uh, the Fair Work Secretary uh, announced that we were increasing that to 26,000 uh, on the way to making sure that we reach 30,000 uh, by 2020. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer? On Monday I met with two modern apprentices, Paul Reid and Ross Menzies, during my visit to InGen, technical services based in Tannockside, Uddingston in my region. InGen has taken on eight modern apprentices at this site alone, with other apprentices being taken on throughout Scotland. Can I ask, therefore, how the modern apprenticeship programme contributed to youth employment levels, which I note that are now at the highest level in a decade? First Minister. Well, modern apprenticeships are a key element of our approach to economic development and to youth employment. They support young people into sustainable and rewarding careers and we have seen them have a big impact on our youth employment rates. Uh, youth employment in Scotland right now is at its highest October to December level in rates since 2006 and over the last year alone the youth employment rate increased by four percentage points. There was an increase in the number of young people in employment uh, by 19,000 uh, taking it to 368,000. Uh, the youth employment strategy sets out our seven year plan to increase youth employment with a world classificational education system that builds on the modern apprenticeship programme that has been so successful. Alice McInnes. Part of that um, seven-year action plan that you have mentioned includes the Equalities Action Plan. Would the First Minister update Parliament on what progress there has been in that, particularly in helping disabled young people into modern apprentices? First Minister. Well, the Modern Apprenticeship Equalities Action Plan was published on the 2nd of December. It includes specific improvement targets for modern apprenticeships, uh, participation by BME, care leavers, disabled people, and uh, also on gender balance. Uh, improvement targets have been included for each group that have to be achieved by 2021, and Skills Development Scotland will report on these annually, improving uh, the balance of participants from underrepresented groups in the ME programme uh, is, of course, not a change that will happen overnight, but it is a change we are determined to see happen. Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. Can the First Minister tell us what plans the Scottish Government has uh, for its share of the UK Government's apprenticeship levy when that comes to Scotland? First Minister. Well, if Murdo Fraser could go on to his colleagues in the Westminster Government and get them to give us the detail of the apprenticeship levy, then we might be able to answer the question what we plan to do with it. Uh, we have been pressing uh, the Treasury uh, and indeed uh, other uh, ministers in the UK government and officials to get that information and we will continue to do so and when we know uh, what the situation is we will try to make sure that we use that as positively as possible to enhance and build on the work that we're doing in this area already. In light of the Third Force News article by the Scottish Children's Services Coalition indicating that only 0.4% 1% of modern apprenticeship starts in 2014-15 had a self-declared disability. This is in stark contrast to the 8.6% of the working population aged 16 to 24 who have a disability. 
Could the First Minister outline the work being undertaken with employers as part of the action plan to ensure that the 2021 target of increasing the number of modern apprenticeships for those with disabilities is achieved? First Minister. Well, working with employers uh, is part of the action plan because obviously it's employers we need to uh, persuade to, uh, of the benefits of making sure that we have a more diverse population in the ME programme and that's, uh, as I say, very much at the heart of the action plan. The targets that I've spoken about that have been set out are challenging targets. They will not, as I've also said, be reached overnight, but progress is already being made following the publication of the action plan. We've already seen some improvement in the proportion of starts from people reporting a disability, uh, three percentage points up on the same point last year. Uh, and we've also seen a slight improvement in those who reported uh, being from a minority ethnic group. So there's work uh, a lot of work still to be done here, Presiding Officer, but those figures uh, are promising and the work that is set out in the Equalities Action Plan uh, gives me confidence that we'll see further progress in the years to come. Ken okay, McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. If uh, modern apprentices are so important to the First Minister, can I ask her why is she cutting the Skills Development Scotland budget in real terms and why in particular is she planning to cut a 50% cut in support for hospitality and retail apprentices until 2020? First Minister. Uh, Ken McIntosh uh, will know, I know he will know, that we're meeting our targets on modern apprentices. We have a record number of modern apprentices, 25,000. Rosanna Cunningham announced just this week that that's going to increase next year uh, to 26,000. And we set a target to get that to 30,000 uh, by 2020. You know, instead of this constant, continual whinging from the sidelines, <laughs> can't Labour just get behind us when we're making progress in such an important issue? Question number five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that young people with neurological conditions receive appropriate care. First Minister. Uh, national clinical standards for neurological health services were implemented in 2010. Uh, we've asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to review how quality of care for people with neurological conditions can be enhanced in all care settings. And this assessment will reflect our national clinical strategy, uh, health and social care integration, as well as evidence of good practice. Furthermore, in 1617, we're investing £250 million a year through health and social care partnerships to protect and grow social care services, uh, and also investing 11.6 million to implement self-directed support and that will increase the availability of social care so that more people can stay at home sharing their lives with their family and friends and doing the things that give uh, their lives meaning and value. Rhoda Grant. Um, can I thank the First Minister for that response? She will be aware that of Sue Ryder's report this week highlighting that young people with neurological conditions are being placed in older people's care homes because of a lack of specialist residential care. It also highlighted that health boards don't know how many people have neurological conditions in their areas and indeed what their needs are. So it's very difficult to see how the health and social care spending will impact on that. More, more than that, only five health Can boards question, please? Are, are, who are supposed to have mandatory delivery plans for neurological services have them. What will the Scottish government do? Will they show leadership? Will they deliver and drive forward a national strategy for people with neurological conditions? First Minister. Uh, well, I am aware of the Sue Ryder uh, report and I think uh, they make a lot of very important and indeed uh, very legitimate points in that report. It's indeed many of the points that are made, including the one that Rhoda Grant highlights about people under 65 and the care settings they're in that is driving the work that I spoke about in my earlier answer, the review that Healthcare Improvement Scotland is undertaking about how quality of care for people with neurological conditions can be enhanced in all care uh, settings. As I said, there are clinical standards in place for neurological services. They were implemented in 2010, uh, but the review of Healthcare Improvement Scotland will allow us to ensure that they remain up to date. And lastly, presiding officer, the, the extra investment in social care uh, is pertinent here, because if we invest properly in social care, then we develop the services that enable people, wherever possible, to stay in and be cared for in their own homes. And that is an important part of this agenda. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the First Minister what measures there are within our penal system, perhaps within our prisons, to identify and assist those who may be suffering from neurological conditions. 
First Minister. I think that's a very good point. Um, I'm happy to ask the uh, Justice Secretary to write to uh, Christine Graham with detail both of uh, what we already do within our prison system to, to deal with people with neurological conditions, but also to reflect on whether uh, or not there might be more that we can and should be doing there. Uh, there are a number of people for a number of different reasons in our prison system who do need a lot of care uh, and support because perhaps some of the reasons they end up in prison uh, are misunderstood or not properly dealt with in the first place in this category it may well be one of those so I'm more than happy to ask the Justice Secretary to uh, write further uh, to Christine Graham on that issue. Roderick Campbell. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the recommendations in the CIRADA report was of the need for the development and implementation of a method for collecting and presenting data on the prevalence of neurological conditions. Does the First Minister agree on the importance of a comprehensive database? First Minister. Yes, I do. I think that was one of the uh, many uh, recommendations made by uh, Sue Ryder that was extremely important and very sensible. Uh, I can tell uh, the Chamber that Dr John Paul Leach was recently appointed as the new chair uh, to the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions and we uh, will work with that group uh, specifically to improve the methods of collecting and presenting uh, data on neurological conditions because that is part of how we then make sure uh, that services are improved in the way we need to see them improve. Dave Thompson. Uh, having suffered a bilateral subdural hematoma myself two and a half years ago and being blessed with an excellent recovery after the fine work of Mr Kamel and his team at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, I wonder if the First Minister can give us an update on the support uh, provided for the ARI Neurological Department and Rigmore Hospital in Inverness, with which it works closely in its treatment of such conditions and particularly in relation to young people. First Minister. Well, I know the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary has identified local clinical leaders in the care of younger people, and I think this is to be commended. Um, I recognise the efforts of clinicians and support staff right across the country in neurosurgery and neurology who work together to ensure safe, effective and person-centred care across all hospitals and specialist centres. It is through joint working, uh, such as the joint working that we see between Aberdeen and Inverness, as well as with primary and community care, that people of all ages are supported by local clinical teams uh, addressing any rehabilitation or other support needs as they return home. So some of the work that's been done in Aberdeen, I, I think, is excellent, uh, and I'm sure other uh, areas around the country could look to it very usefully. Richard Simpson. I wonder if the First Minister could tell us whether the Neurological Alliance, that's the group of the organisations representing patients, has in fact received money. Their direct grant was stopped, but their indirect grant through the Alliance was the subject of discussion. Can she confirm they've been funded? Yeah. First Minister. I'm more than happy to look into that issue, President Officer, and write to the member with the, the detail of it. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the BBC's proposal to introduce a Scottish Six news programme. First Minister. Uh, I welcome it. I think it's a, a good idea. The UK has, of course, changed dramatically since devolution, but I think in some respects uh, the BBC has still to catch up with those changes and deliver news programming that reflects the complexity, the variety and the richness of life in Scotland. So we do welcome proposals to introduce a dedicated news service for BBC Scotland uh, and I'm sure it will uh, draw on the very best of our journalistic talent uh, to produce programmes of the very highest standard. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister? I'm interested in the point that uh, she has just intimated about the most important consideration being the ability of BBC Scotland to harness the very best broadcasting talent so that it will deliver the highest possible standards when it comes to reporting UK, international and Scottish news. But will she also agree that this should be entirely free from governments and politicians, some of whom in recent years have sought to in influence what is broadcast on the BBC? First Minister. Yes, I do. I'm very happy to agree with Liz Smith that the Conservative UK government should really stop interfering in the BBC. As you do quite often. Uh, but yes, on a serious note, I do agree with that point. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there is a really interesting debate here, but I think there's a really exciting opportunity. I, I understand there might be people in Scotland, perfectly legitimately, who don't think this is required, that it's maybe not something that is necessary. What I really struggle to understand, though, 
are those who argue that somehow in Scotland, and BBC Scotland in particular, somehow adding up to producing a dedicated news programme with the journalistic talent we have in Scotland. Of course they are. I think it would be a great addition uh, and I'm very supportive of what has been proposed. Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that the establishment of a Scottish Six would also provide great opportunities for those individuals, for example, who are currently being trained at North East Scotland College in Aberdeen uh, in broadcasting and journalism and would allow opportunities for them to retain those skills within Scotland rather than, as so often is the case, having to seek opportunities elsewhere. First Minister. I think that's a really good point. We should all be in the business of trying to see more opportunities uh, for those who want to pursue a career in journalism. We know, and this is a matter of great regret to all of us, uh, how much difficulty some sections of the media are in and the pressures in particular that are on the, the newspaper industry and the uh, announcements that have been over the last number of years about uh, redundancies and job losses in newspapers. So anything that is about reversing that trend and creating more opportunities for bright young journalists to get on and pursue their careers in Scotland is something that we should all frankly put party politics aside on and unite behind as a thoroughly great idea. Before I end First Minister's questions, can I thank all of the party leaders for the brevity today, the result of which was that an additional 10 backbench members were able to ask the First Minister a question. I intend to circulate this video to the party leaders. I hope you will watch it and I hope we will have a repeat next week. Thank you very much. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.